One of the things we decided is, well, look, we need to dare to lead in pricing. I cannot start looking at people and try to just look at the market and see what the market will accept. I have to be honest and say, this is what the market needs to be at for there to be a market. And if we don't do this, there won't be a market. So let's get there first and let's show people direction we're going very clearly. Mm -hmm. And those that can see that and have the managerial courage to do it could follow and have a little bit of an umbrella and then find this new place where value is fair for our customers and fair for the businesses. This is episode 196 with Augusto and Justin of National Pool Partners. Enjoy! Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us today. You've both been on the podcast before, but for those that may have not listened, can you please introduce yourselves and what your role is at National Pool Partners? Sure. My name is Augusto Titarelli. I'm CEO of National Pool Partners. My name is Justin Cooperberg. I'm Chief Development Officer for National Pool Partners. Awesome. Thank you. So today we're going to jump into the topic of inflation, you know, and what the industry can do to not only survive it, but remain profitable through it. So first, can you please explain what inflation is? Yeah, I'll jump in right there. Inflation in its, you know, purest definition is a decline in in purchasing power over a period of time. And what that really means are in an era where costs of goods and services are rising, the amount of profit or money that you have is buying less of those goods and services. And so that causes inflation. Right. Thank you. So do you have a story that you wanted to share about kind of some hyperinflation? Yeah. So I experienced hyperinflation in the flash. Uh, Beginning of my career, I was the plant manager for a small electronics company in Brazil. And Brazil at that time, I was experiencing 88% inflation a month. Oh, wow. Um, And having to survive in that environment required us to raise prices like twice a month and pay our employees, um, not only pay them frequently, but also release them because they would have to get paid on a Friday and go straight to the supermarket because by Monday, that money that we pay them bought 20% less. Um, So one of the things that hyperinflation and inflation does in general is accelerate things so much. The cycles become super short. And it requires you to be very agile to fight that off. So as I said, instead of moving prices annually, we were moving prices twice a month. And if you sold anything 30 days down the line, the money you got 30 days down had to be factored into the fact that it was going to buy 80% less of what we normally did. Very difficult times to, uh, to survive. Um, and the tough part of that is that to fix that, um, it took a long period of time. It took about three, four years for, for that inflation to be combated. So during that period, we had to always stay ahead of inflation. One of the I, things I always say about hyperinflation is you can't, you can't compensate for the inflation you already suffered. You can only compensate for the inflation that you're going to suffer in the future. So that's mm-hmm. why that agility is so important. Right. And that's obviously an extreme of what's going on here. Yeah. We US, certainly but... hope that never <laughs> hits this, uh, this country. And I don't think, I don't think it, it will, but if you listen to what the fad has been saying, it's going to be a t- two to three year journey for this thing to kind of go back to what we're used to. Right. Yeah. And I think the reason that's important to share that story is just, you've had a lot of experience in it. So that's why we're kind of go down this journey with you on this episode, but just the fact that you've been in extremes versions of it can definitely help with these times, right? Absolutely. I think you'll learn some uh, hard lessons, but the lesson of agility and being ahead of the game is, I think, uh, the most important one. Right. So let's discuss kind of sectoral infl- inflation then, So, which is obviously a little bit different than inflation itself. What's the difference and how does that affect the pool industry? Well, I think we've we've come to a point where we're in a perfect storm of problems. You know, any one of the problems the pool industry has faced would have been unique in a hundred years. You know, the labor issues that we faced, you know, the, the, um, the chlorine pricing and the factory burning down, right. The, 
the supply issues for what happened in Texas and the freeze, the the construction of new pools being at an all time high, COVID hitting, right? You've got all of these factors addressing one particular industry where any one of those factors would have been monumental to our industry. Now we're we're combating a multi prong fight here of trying to address all of these issues all at once, all within a short period of time, you know, within a year, you know, we've, we've had those price increases, those labor shortages, we're still reeling from the effects of COVID. Yeah. And as Justin was saying, um, that drove sectoral inflation in the pool industry to be so much higher. People keep talking about 7%, 8% systemic inflation in our economy. But when you look at this perfect storm that Justin just described, when you look at what happened into our sector, we're seeing inflation rates that, uh, in some cases, for some products, hit 180% a year. So my example of 80% inflation in, in Brazil may, might seem extreme, but we have seen actually parts of our industry actually suffer similar levels of inflation. Uh, we have chlorine going up 69%. If you take prices from March 2020 and compare to prices now, you have inflation in, on chemicals running from anywhere from 25% to 180%, chlorine 69%. Um, and if you look at labor too, uh, with the scarcity of labor, uh, we've seen um, labor rates jump um, to sometimes as high as $20 uh, an hour. Um, and we're competing uh, with, with other companies that, that are sustaining those prices. So we don't see that coming back again. So when you look at the sectorial inflation, uh, we're, we're seeing uh, much higher numbers than what the general economy is. Um, so if you try to fight off inflation based on what the rest of the economy is doing, you're going to be behind uh, the game. You will not be able to compensate what, for what has already happened in our industry, which, again, is a perfect storm. Uh, it, it's, it's a 100-year event. It, it takes 100 years for something as in cataclysmic as this to hit all of us at the same time in such a short period of time. So it requires 10 times the agility to, to deal with that and a real hard grasp of the numbers. What's truly happening? If you don't look in detail to what your product cost is, what your labor cost is, it's going to be very difficult to react, whichever way you plan to react. But it's going to be very difficult to react. You don't have a grounded understanding of what's truly happening in your sector and how you're going to deal with that. You know, I was talking to a friend that owned a bakery. Right? And they were complaining that the cost of sugar, flour, eggs are up 20%. And I'd say, in our industry, we'd gladly take that right now. Right? That would <laughs> be, right. A, that'd be a win for us if we could, we could just have a 20% price increase. But we're seeing that it, within months on a consistent basis. Right? So that, that 20% where other sectors are experiencing, we're looking at the 180% that Augusto just described. And that's just on a component, you know, 50%. You look at gas, you look at labor, you look at chlorine, you look at um, hard supplies, you know, heaters are up 30%. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty insane jump, especially within the industry. How do you recommend people kind of figure out what percentages are being adjusted on those prices? You know, because the people aren't paying attention to what's coming out from pool corps of the world or, you know, the distributors of the world, how are we figuring out that those, that is those percentages that are going up? Well, as I said, you really have to do some intense math to understand what's going on in the industry. I think that step number one is really take good stock of what your costs really are uh, and use a, a time reference. Uh, it, uh, cost without a time reference doesn't help much, but if you anchor your original pricing, for example, or costs, uh, say t to a year ago, wh what was happening in March 2020, and then you go out and just update your, your key products, maybe the 10 things that really are really important for your company, and then look at that one by one, and then look at your labor, right? And understand first what, how these costs have moved. That, that's very important, just getting good stock of your true reality how you're buying, and how much you're buying it for. That's very critical. And then you have to understand what is happening to your margins as a consequence of that. One of the things I learned about uh, inflationary environments is that 
because cycles become so fast, cash is king. So the first thing you need to do when you're in, in high inflation is protect your cash flow. If you don't protect your cash flow, uh, you run the risk of disappearing as a business. So once you know your cost basis, understand what your cash flow was and what you were living off of, and then figure out what you need to do with your cost structure and your price structure to ensure that you have at least the same amount of cash flow to perpetuate your business. And then there's another thing you need to do is look forward. It is what is it required of my pricing strategy and my costing strategy to preserve that cash flow, not in today's world with the costs that I just calculated, but with the costs that I think are going to be predominant in the future. And I need the price now for that. And one, one example I like to give to show uh, how you can never win against inflation if you're reactive, uh, you can only win if you're proactive, is that imagine someone that has a shop that sells hundred bucks of something um, retail. And that person has a price today that yields a certain margin that's comfortable. That person sees that there's going to be price increases and decides to do one thing, which is, you know what? I'm going to buy six months worth of material now because I can lock in my price. And so the person does that, invests a lot of capital and sells for the next six months at the current price. So that person realized over the next six months exactly the margin that that person expected. It's no dilution of margin because I bought ahead. Except that six months down the line, I take all the money and I want to replenish that stock. And now my business, if I had had a 25% increase in that product during that period, my business just shrank 25%. So I made the same amount of cash, but when I want to replenish my inventory, now I don't have enough money to do the same. So now I'm only selling 75 buckets instead of 100 a month. And what that leads to, if you're not careful, if you don't raise your prices 25%, even if you do buy the product six months in advance, six months down the line, your business is 75% of what it used to be. And then what happens is four times in a row, you disappear. Yep. <laughs> It makes sense. I, I get and that. For we sure. look at lots of businesses, right? Because we're in the in the business of acquiring companies. Sure. And what you find is that owners don't realize this until they do their taxes or some other event happens, right? So right. these changes, although drastic and impacting their wallet at the end of the day, largely go unnoticed, right? Until they do some reconciliation at year end with their accountant or tax advisor and realize, holy cow, I'm making 25% in Augusto's, you know, example, less than I did the year before and I'm working twice as hard. Right. And in order for us to do that ourselves at our company, we actually had to develop some tools to calculate that. Because as I said, agility is critical. You can't do that once a year. You might have to do that every month now. So we developed a calculator that allows us to keep eyes on that. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll cite a few examples that came out of some, some of our own stuff that we, uh, we looked at, our, our own branches and, and what we realized. Uh, we, we took a branch that had approximately 20% profit and looked at what would have happened to that branch's cash if we had 25% inflation in, in costs in general, just 25, which is way less than what's actually happening over the past year. That with a 25% inflation, and if you had 20% margin, your cash flow is cut in half if you don't move prices. Mm. Literally, it's cut in half. In order for you to maintain the same cash flow, you would probably have to raise prices between 25 and 27%. Obviously, what people will tell you is that, well, if I raise my prices 27% or 30%, I'll lose a lot of my customers. So we also started calculating, well, how many customers can I lose at the new price and still make the same amount of money? And the interesting math is that you can afford to lose about almost 27% of your customers and make actually more money and more cash than if you don't raise prices and keep the customer base that you currently have at the old price. So if you don't move fast, 
and if you look at this example, your business would be automatically reduced to half of what it is in terms of cash flow generation. And you won't even be able to sustain your base going forward. So you might lose the t- same 27% anyway. So it was important for us to put that in, in a framework that we could use to calculate these things. Another more extreme example, we took a same branch and said, what if it's actually inflation is 50%? If inflation hit 50%, the cash flow goes from 20% of your income to zero. It goes to absolutely zero. So you have no money. You are out of the business if you don't react quickly. In that situation, you would have to raise prices probably 35% to fix it. And when you do that, you might lose more customers. You might lose a third of your base. But even if you lost a third of your base, you still would have a healthier business at the end of that time than if you didn't touch prices. Now, imagine someone sitting on this problem for a full year which is what we normally do in the industry. Every year we review our prices and figure out what we're going to do about that. Right. If I wait a year, I will not have a business at the end of that time. And one of the things we said is that we wanted to elevate the industry. And, and, and I really want the industry to see the risk it is facing from this acceleration of inflation and the insane sectoral inflation that we're seeing. Because I think all businesses, if they want to be around, they – They need to look into this issue and calculate and understand what their margins are, what their costs are, and figure out what are my trade-offs. Do I want to raise my prices and accept a little lower base, but be able to continue to serve people with quality going forward, right? So these trade-offs are difficult decisions to make, and, and having a framework, as I said, to calculate that stuff is very helpful. Because the reality is that we're facing inflation in our industry, much like the second example that Augusto gave more than the first. So that these owners are going to be facing the music at some point that's going to show zero cash at the end of the day Mm -hmm. if they don't do something. And what we find is owners go by the national news, right? Where they say, oh, CPI is up 7% for the year. So I'll, I'll go raise my prices 7%. Well, in Augusto's example, that 7% will, will not get you back anywhere near to the cash flow that you had experienced prior. And you really have to spend time figuring that out because if you only get up 7% and then you realize two months later that you didn't go high enough, you got to do it again and then yep. again. And you know that's when you really- That's when you lose credibility. That credibility right. and those you, you customers credibility. really don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> That's when it sounds more like price gouging, right? And not only that, uh, customers feel you're just passing on the problem to them. Mm -hmm. And you're driving it out of ignorance rather than scientifically looking at what you need to do. One of the things that customers need to understand, we're not passing 100% of the cost. As I said, we're facing facing off 50% inflation with 35% price increases. It's not like we're trying to, oh, inflation is 50%, I'm going to raise my prices 50%. 50%. That is not necessary. If you're really scientific about it, if you really look at how these things work and you have good information about where you are, you will be able to do something that it will be perceived as fair. One of the things that we're able to tell our customers, like, look, we, we had to take a price increase and we explained to our customers why we needed to do that. So that deference, that knowing that you owe an explanation to your customers why you're doing that, helping your customers see that, plus you're being real f- fine-tuned in how you calculate that. We got very positive support from a good chunk of our customers because they understood what we're doing and they understood I'm not taking 50% and slapping that on on top of them. Hey, it's your problem, customer. It's not. We're part of the industry and your customers, we need to kind of figure out what's fair together. If you go to a mode where you're raising prices consistently, as you said, customers lose credibility in your services. Well, you're not really managing this. You're just passing out the problem to me. And we owe to our customers to actually get ahead of this and fix it one time. And as Augusto said, do it in a, in a humanizing way where you're not just sending a form letter saying, uh, you know, due to unforeseen circumstances, your price is now moving from X to Y, right? We're, we're giving the, the support behind it, the reason behind it, so that there's, there's a story and, and a thought process to the price increase rather than we just threw a dart against a wall and wherever it landed, that's your new price. I think that's a huge piece of it, right? And 
that's where the industry fails a lot of times is communicating properly to the customers. And they just assume that it's going to be okay or not okay, and they're just going to do something quickly, and they don't really spend the time to think about it. Right? Yeah. If you educate the customer correctly, more than likely, I mean, you have a couple of examples from the different branches, but they will support that cause or be okay with it. Now, you're going to, and then you're going to have the ones that you lose, right? That we talked about. And those are probably most likely, we've all discussed it, the problem customers you deal with on a daily basis, right? Or the cheap customers that never want to replace anything or fix anything, or just ones that cause problems within your office or whoever. So it's really going to be cutting the fat per se customers of the ones that you probably don't want anyways. There'll be a few in there that just don't understand, but you know, majority of those you're losing are probably the ones that aren't making you money anyways. Right. In most cases also, those customers will be looking for alternatives in the market, right? Yeah. And when they realize that companies that have thought it through are at the price points that, that represent a reality versus companies that may be a lower price point, but can't guarantee the, the, the going forward of that, that same service. Um, and I, I've seen a, that, a lot of that, people that have moved their prices um, maybe 7 or 8% and can't secure the materials to actually provide proper uh, treatment of the pools, right? right? So I think those customers, even those that leave, may at one point also understand that this is a new reality for the industry. This is a new baseline upon which we all operate. And in that circumstance, we need to focus on providing value to the customer. This is what it really takes for us to do something good for you in, in, with quality, with consistency, and with continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have to, one of the things that we're uh, doing is that we're setting up our supply chain strategy to be able to guarantee that we have continuity of service throughout next year. And this is very important. So I can tell my customers, hey, I'll, I'll be there for you, right? Um, and, and once you explain it to the customers, as you said, uh, customers will understand. If you're fair, I made a point of writing the letter to my customers personally, myself, because I wanted them to know what I know mm -hmm. and why we're making these decisions. And it was very interesting. And we had a branch where we, we did an a early price increase uh, on March 1st. And we were obviously very concerned because it was, it was a huge number. It was it was substantially above 30% price increase. Um, and we were obviously saying, well, we'll need to understand what the market will accept. Part of that reason is below mark, it was below market value. It was below right. market so value. So you had to so, go a little so bit. So I had, I had a much greater distance to walk right. back to being healthy. The right. business was at risk. And um, we obviously monitored social media. And it was super interesting to see that obviously we got a lot of uh, complaints on social media. But at the same time, there was the same number of customers defending us and using the arguments that we put in that letter uh, to the customer to explain to them, this is what we're saying. Um, and we want to be here for you. Um, and it was very rewarding to see that when properly communicated to, when in, in possession of good information that makes sense, that is, that's considerate, right? We owe our customers that explanation. Customers will understand and will assess the fairness of what you're trying to do. I'm not saying go out and raise prices 30% because we can. It's a, 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 an opportunistic approach to this. Do something that's fair. You need to be able to justify it to your customers and make them believe that that is a fair move. If you can't do that, don't touch prices because you're not ready. Right. Um, and you will have to take some risk. You have to understand. And we will, as you said, lose some customers. Some customers may have want to retain, but also some customers that don't see the value in what you're doing. And those are not long-term customers anyway. Right. Right. So it's been an interesting journey. We're learning more as we go. Um, but we're seeing more, more of a positive slant in social media and customers calling in. Um, and I can't share the numbers because they're private. But um, the cancellations that we've seen so far have, have undershot what we were prepared to take. Sure. So it's been that positive for us. I can also tell you that just this week I was on next door in my community and I live in Florida and another pool service company, not one that we owned raised a customer's price and must not have explained fully the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And this customer decided to lash out on next door saying I got a $25 per month increase. Is this normal? And 
of course, my curiosity was piqued, right? right so right. <laughs> to go read 88 responses to that lash out on it. And it was almost unanimously, yes, this is the new normal. This is what the industry is experiencing. And this isn't other pool people speaking. This is are just residents within the community saying this, this is absolutely the times we're living in and what to be expected. Yeah. And I think, you know, a few different things, right? The, the industry has already been underpriced, you know, for one, which if you look at different types of service industries, HVAC, plumbing, you know, those type of things, they're all right. They're all a lot higher than what we do anyway. So there's a piece of that that's getting corrected within this market, which I think will stay. And then there's also everything we talked about. But one thing that doesn't change, right? Your, your quality of service has to be there too. You know what I mean? And, and that's a big deal. If I think some people want to raise prices, but not raise the quality of service or not maintain a high level quality of service. Right. And that, that's not going to be sustainable either. So there's a, that's another thing to think about when you're, when you're doing this, right? <laughs> it's like deferred maintenance. Now, and we're seeing that we're, we're seeing some competitors trade off price for quality. That sure. means a reduction of either frequency or quantity or, or processes or simplification of processes in the absence of material, of material cost increases or labor cost increases. That's going to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. At one point, that does catch up with you. Um, when cash hits the bank and you're not able to do what you were doing before because your volume is lower and you don't have the same amount of cash, you can't keep doing that forever. At one point, everyone's going to be faced with this hard decision of having to know where does my price need to be for me to guarantee quality, fairness, and continuity to my customer. Yeah, it's Greg and I, when we ran Brothers several years ago, we knew we had to go higher on prices, but we didn't really feel like our team was there, right? So there was several times we held off on going, increasing our base rate because we just didn't think we could provide that. <laughs> so if you don't have the team, you don't have the quality of service, it's difficult to, to pass that on. And, you know, once you hit that point, and that's a just big factor when you're thinking about how, how high to go or what you need to do, if you don't have the team to do it, you know, you got to make other decisions too, right? Along with that. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we discuss how the industry can best fight inflation and take a deep dive into the inflation calculator, how it works, and how you can download it. Hey, pool pros. My name is Bryce Sarine. And I'm Zach Singer. And we're with Beyond Pool Cleaning here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we're here with your skimmer tip of the week. Now that it's cooling off and phones aren't ringing nonstop, you can start to game plan for next year. Consider spending some time updating all of your customer information, equipment, and photos. Remember when we did that for our business? Oh yeah, the time savings were great. No more checking the horsepower on pumps or double checking the filter size for new grids when it's over 100 degrees outside. So much easier to have all the info at your fingertips. So as you're going about your route this week, spend a few minutes per stop to update your customer photos and equipment in Skimmer. We always try to get a photo of the labels, the pool, and the equipment from a few feet away. Then you'll see the equipment section right underneath the recent activity. Having everything entered into that is a huge time saver, especially when a customer calls with a question. Plus, it integrates with the skimmer shopping list, so you aren't wondering what pump basket or O-ring you need later when you're at distribution. Absolutely. And you can even tag the single speed versus variable speed pump customers and send out an upgrade email with energy saving tips and recommendations. That's just another way Skimmer saves us time during that busy season. To find out more, check out episodes 138 and 154 of the podcast, or go to getskimmer.com forward slash pool chasers. That's getskimmer.com forward slash pool chasers. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is supported by Pool RX. Well, it's that time of year again. Pool RX is having their spring big sale event. That means it's time for you to stock up for this summer. When we're running brothers, this was one of our favorite times of year. We got a discount on the product, but more importantly, we were setting our pools up to be successful and reducing chemical usage, which saved us a ton of time and money. Let me tell you a little bit more about the product. Polarex eliminates and prevents all types of algae, reduces chlorine demand, and lasts up to six months. With Polarex, there is no need for phosphate removers, clarifiers, or other algicides. When using Polarex, you will see high-definition water clarity. I mean, the pools just pop. Right now, you can get $15 off a four-pack of blue units and $17.50 off a four-pack of black units at your favorite distribution location. The sale ends April 30th, so get them while you can. If you want to find out more about the product and how you can reduce your chlorine usage this summer, check out episode 142 
visit PolarX.com or click the link below. So we talked about a few of it already, but how do you think the industry kind of fights inflation then? What do we do? So I think in my mind, first thing is get ahead of the problem. As I said before, you can't fix for the inflation you already suffered. You have to fix it for the inflation you're going to have to suffer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to take a stance as an industry. Um, in my first podcast here, I, I said that this industry sometimes doesn't get the respect it deserves mm -hmm. um, from its own customers. And actually, customers are willing to give us that respect. That's what we've learned in the past 18 months. Sure. If you talk to customers and if you understand, you make them see what value you're delivering. They'll work with you. So the first thing is understand where you need to be for this industry to be able to continue to do good work of good value for good customers. Number one, if you don't understand that, you don't have a plan. Second thing is knowing that you need to plan for the inflation to come. Know your numbers. Know thyself. Mm -hmm. Know thyself. You have to understand what's truly happening uh, uh, with your cost base with your GNA, your general expenses, and how cash is flowing every month into your bank account. And then make a decision based on that. This is a cut, uh, as I used to say, measure twice, cut, cut once. once. Right. Cut once, yeah. You, you want to make sure that you look at the problem um, carefully in detail and make one good move that you can explain to your customer. So that's, I think, how the industry needs to do uh, this. And it's not just about getting more price. It's about getting the value the industry deserves. If you look at other, other home services industries, what they've already done with pricing, in the face of much lower sectorial inflation that we're seeing, mm -hmm. other industries that are facing uh, the 78% we keep talking about are moving prices 10 15%. They're doing that. Mm -hmm. And we're behind eight ball in face of a much higher sectorial inflation. So I think we need to first take stock of our reality, understand what this perfect storm meant for the industry and individually to each one of us, and then figure out how we're going to get ahead of that instead of trying to just a year from now react, well, I didn't make money, so now I need to raise prices. It's going to be too late. You'll never yeah. see this money again. That, that's a really important point. That money that you've lost, the last 12 months, that's gone and forgotten. You're, you're never going to get that back. But as Augusto said, what you really need to focus on is the next, you need to be proactive, the next six months, the next 12 months, and plan for that rather than looking in the past. And, and doing that helps you tell your customers what the next 12 months are going to look like, which if my customers know that their price is going to be stable for the next 12 months, because I made an adjustment and I can live with that. Um, it helps slow inflation now. Mm. Because what happens with inflation, if, if you keep adjusting very frequently, it just accelerates much faster. And then you can never catch up with it. If I make one bump and sit at it, and people start seeing the stability, if people start seeing prices not moving for a year, the, the fear factor that inflation uh, infuses, diminishes, and people start to slow down these cycles that keep pushing costs up. So that's, that's sometimes how you need to do it. It's sometimes taking a, a very drastic measure, but it allows you to stabilize your operating mode, let's say, for a long period of time so that, you know, customers know, these guys come in here, this is my new price, it's going to be like this for 12 months. And I ask people today, could you guarantee your current price for 12 months for your base? And you'll find 90% of the people will say, I can't do that. Uh, you see that in contracting business, but that being contracting, people have now built clauses and it says, well, if, if I'm going to build something for you in eight months down the line, the price, eight months going to be whatever the price is eight months down. We don't have that benefit. We're in the service industry. Mm -hmm. I have to give my customers a price that will hold for a period of time. Right. So I got to be super... Uh, scientific about it. I really need to know um, um, with surgical accuracy where I'm going to put that price point because I need to tell my customers the next 12 months are going to be like this. And if we do that and we create this stability around pricing, we will have conquered a new respect from 
for the value we provide and slow down inflation altogether. In the market. And, and that's the danger of just making a rash decision to, I'll just raise prices 7% without understanding any of the, the, the details behind it and not communicating it well and, and all the other problems we see is those rash decisions really put you in a worse position. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we talked a little bit about numbers and the calculator. Can we dive down to the calculator a little bit deeper and what you guys have built? And if you, is that going to be available publicly? Um, well, so let me talk about the calculator first. We felt it was necessary um, to put some sort, sort of methodology to understand what was going on. It's easier to take a cost multiplied by a factor and say, well, that's my price. Well, that's not true. It doesn't work like that. There are a lot of things that play here. So, for example, uh, if you raise prices and lose customers, uh, your routes lose density. Because, obviously, you're not going to lose customers only in one place and be able to maintain your route efficiency. Mm -hmm. So, we had to take into consideration what happens when I raise price, lose certain customers, what my new route efficiencies are, how, uh, how that cost moves now that I couldn't capture 100% of that customer base reduction into my route density. So there's a lot of factors at play. So what we did was we, we took all those things and frankly created an algorithm that takes maybe four or five inputs. We made it real simple because our branches need to be able to see this very frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and calculate all that stuff in the background. And what it tells you fundamentally is, hey, if I put my price here, how many customers can I lose and still maintain my cash? That's one question that the algorithm answers. The other one is, look, if I'm willing to sacrifice up to 20% of my base and I have 25% inflation, what's the minimum price I need to set for me to have the same profitability? Or if I want to maintain my revenue, what is the minimum price that I need to set for my customers if I have a certain amount of inflation? So it solves very basic questions through this algorithm. So we, we did it for ourselves, first thing. And we, so we're using that. Um, and it was very illuminating. We made all our pricing decisions based on that algorithm. Right. And... Um, it has some assumptions in there that work for us. I'm, I can't tell you that it will work for every single company. That There are multiple ways people do things. Um, but it's, it's a good approximation, right? And we said that we're here to help elevate the industry. I'd, I'd be glad to share it. Um, I want companies to look at their reality, and I think the algorithm and uh, the spreadsheet helps them do that. Because there's no secret math in it. it. It's something everyone could do it, but it's done. So I'd, I'd be glad to share that. Um, again, I'll just make a disclaimer. Um, two things are important to me. First, super important. We're not trying to fix prices. We just want people to get fair value for a fair price. And if you're in the right price point and you run that algorithm, it will tell you that don't move your prices. So I'm not trying to use that to push the industry to fix prices or do anything like that. The other disclaimer is that it has some assumptions in there that work for the companies that we own. We own 17 companies, and, and we took an average of what's going on in every area. It allows you for, to adapt it to your route size, your typical uh, hourly rate, your cost of material. So all of that is, is open in the algorithm. You can feed that stuff in there. Um, but it does contain some stuff that applies to us. So I wouldn't recommend someone to just blindly taking that and use it as the absolute truth. Just think through well, what, what that thing is giving you as information and see if it makes sense and then move on. It would be one more uh, arrow in the quiver, if you will, for people to look at their businesses. And, um, you know, if we are helping the industry by doing that, um, let's do that. I'll, I'm happy to do that. By the way, you can run, large companies are going to run two routes on that algorithm and see what's happening. So it would be even helpful for a one polar to understand, hey, this is my price point. This is what I've seen with materials. What do I want to do with my route? It's, it's an unbelievable educational tool more than anything else. Right? And it helps you really think through the business at hand, right? And, and understand the components. I think for the, for that, 
it's incredibly valuable for anyone, as Augusto said, from a one polar to a large company can all benefit from it. Yeah. And I've had the opportunity to, to play with it quite a bit now. Um, and I think it's a pretty incredible tool. I, I, we talked yesterday and I said, you know, you could Google inflation calculators, right. But, but nothing like specific for the industry like this has ever been built that I've ever seen. So it's, it's a pretty cool tool to be able to actually show you your numbers if you, have, but you do have to do research, right? You got, like you said, you have to understand what those margins are, what the price increases are, what the material costs increase are, all those things come into play. So it's not just a, I'm going to give you input data and get you a price. You know what I mean? It has to be, there's intense work that kind of takes to you get that You have to know numbers. the inputs, correct? Right? You have to know your own inputs in order to get the the valuable result at the end of the of the day. Right. And that's just the benefit, I think, of the national company coming in that we've talked about several times on the podcast. And I'm, I'm super excited for things like this to come into play, right? Because a lot of relationships that I have with many business owners, they don't, talk about these things. Like you mentioned, Justin, we look at it once a year, right? With a financial person that tells you what it is. Even when Greg and I were running brothers, it was like, here, we want to, we want to make this, this is our budget. Can you put it together for us? And, you know, we had it once those meetings once a year or twice a year where it was like, are you hitting those, that budget? Yes or no. And oh, okay, I'll cool. sit across from you an know? owner and ask them about <laughs> margins and pricing and oh, we do pretty well, right? right. That'll be the answer, right? We, <laughs> yeah. we do good. Right. Uh, or they'll look at the the gum on their sole of their shoes because they don't know the answer, right? right. They, they, they just never look at the business that way. Yeah. And, and this, this can help elevate that mm -hmm. and get them to focus on an aspect of the business that's critical for their continuity. And I think it solves what you said earlier about them working harder than they ever worked before, but making 25% less. less, right? It solves that problem in a way where you can actually work hard for a business that's worth something at the end of the day. Majority of the industry doesn't know what their business is worth. They right. have no idea. And this, you know, calculator will help get you to a point where it, it meets standards, right? Or goes hopefully ahead of standards that you can right. now say, look, I have an actual business worth something, not just a route. You know? Right. And and I'll, to that point, we, we try to make it real simple. And the one thing that people look at and can look at frequently is cash. Right. Cash never lies. If you have cash at the end of the, the month in the bank, you did well. If you don't, you didn't. So our calculator spits out a cash computation because that's the thing people understand, right? And to the point of how much is a company worth, people don't look at paper profit. They look at cash flow to put a value on your company. Mm -hmm. So if you want to build a valuable company, you have to build a healthy cash flow. So imagine a situation where you have 25% of inflation and your cash flow as a consequence reduces to 50% as the example from the calculator I gave. Mm -hmm. That means your business now is worth half. Right. And people don't associate sometimes the drop in cash with the reduction in value of the business they own. Sometimes a, life, a lifetime of work building a business can see a 50% value reduction because inflation is unchecked. Right. And that's what we're trying to do. It's make it simple. People can look at cash. And if they preserve cash and value, they can preserve the value of their companies. Majority owners just look at revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And if, oh, I, I have 100 customers. I have 500 customers. I have 700 customers. I get three customers a week calling for new service. Well, that's all good. But at the end of the day, how much cash are you generating? And if you're not generating the cash that you did a year ago, all those new customers, all that business that you're doing is, is generating a reduction yep. in value for your business. Right. And I think, you know, it's important to talk about this in a way too, that we're not discussing it on trying to get people to sell their businesses, right? This is a, like, we love this industry. I love this industry. I've been in it for 10 years. You know, you guys are all coming into it and seeing how great it can be but it only works if the business is here, right? If the industry is here, it, if we don't have people running profitable businesses besides MPP, then it doesn't make sense, right? right. It has to be a, a competitive landscape. Yeah, absolutely. Co competition is critical. And if you have more companies that continue to play in the market and all of these companies are worth more, the whole industry is worth more. Yep. And without having to put more effort or buy my, more companies, our business is worth more. 
So that's when we say we want to elevate the, the industry, it's because of that. Because if this industry is looked at as something more valuable than it is today, which means more companies being more profitable, uh, everybody's boat is floated by that tide. Mm -hmm. And that helps NPP. And we're not doing this because we're great philanthropists. We obviously want to make money. Right. But we also make money when everyone makes money. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you have people that are not seeing the situation for what it is, these people are holding the whole industry back. Right. Because what happens is before, and, and it's, it happened to us as well, before you raise prices, you look around and see what your competitors are doing. And ultimately you have that competitor to say, well, it's kind of a reference. So he, if he or she didn't move the price ahead, I'm not going to do the same thing. And we end up in this Mexican standoff in the industry where everyone is looking at everybody to see who's going to move first and nobody moves. And meanwhile, everybody's cash is going down the drain. And next thing you know, nobody moves prices because everyone's afraid of everybody else. And then all our businesses are worth half, right? So one of the things we decided is, well, look, we need to dare to lead in pricing. I cannot start looking at people and try to just look at the market and see what the market will accept. I have to be honest and say, this is what the market needs to be at for there to be a market. And if we don't do this, there won't be a market. So let's get there first and let's show people direction we're going very clearly. Mm -hmm. And those that can see that and have the managerial courage to do it could follow and have a little bit of an umbrella and then find this new place where value is fair for our customers and fair for the businesses. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Just to wrap up the calculator conversation, we, we're going to work with you guys to, to share that and make it available to the industry and for people that can actually use it. So great. I think it's, it's going to uh, be it, We're really happy cool to share tool. that. We're going to take another quick break. When we get back, we discuss if inflation is here to stay, why a price increase is preserving profit, not price gouging, and how to stay ahead of future inflation. This episode is brought to you by Leslie's. Leslie's continues to deliver for pool trade professionals by providing benefits no one else can offer. The Leslie's Pro Partner Program can help you grow your business through referrals while also providing their most exclusive pricing and best-in-class warranties on equipment. The Leslie's Pro Partner Program is for pros looking to build a true partnership with their supplier. Stop by your local Leslie's to learn how you can become a pro partner today or check out episodes 151 and 165 of the podcast for more details. This episode is also brought to you by Aquastar Pool Products. Aquastar Pool Products is a leading maker of VGB compliant drain covers, but also offers many other products to the industry, including skimmers, deck drains, autofills, cleaners, mosaics, ozone, chemical feeders, spa jets, and fittings. Now, Aquastar is proud to announce a new addition to its lineup with the launch of the Pipeline Cartridge Filter. The Pipeline Cartridge Filter, which is available in two different sizes, was designed with the pro's time, safety, and comfort in mind. It delivers top-notch hydraulic efficiency along with best-in-class filtration performance approaching that of DE filters. And these claims are backed by NSF International Certification Test Results. For more details, ask your local Aquastar sales rep or visit aquastarpoolproducts.com. That's aquastarpoolproducts.com or click the link below. So do you think inflation is here to stay? Inflation sets itself in very quickly and it's hard to eradicate. If you look at what the Fed is saying, I would go with what the Fed said. The Fed is saying it's about two to three years to get inflation back under control. Um, to the levels that we had before. Um, and there we're planning on about another five interest uh, raises this year. So if you, that's another reason why I, I keep saying it's very important to protect cash because if you have to go finance yourself, your working capital, it's going to be more expensive to do that in the coming months than not, right? So I think inflation is going to be here to stay from, from the standpoint in two, three years, we're going to see a, a, a general economic uh, fight against, uh, against inflation, and, and, and that, that will be a tough fight. It will mean higher interest rates, probably more tax. People don't talk about that, but the way you, you fight inflation is with taxation. Mm -hmm. So we've got to see that part, which, which is a risk, though, depending on who is in control of the house. If we don't do that, that inflation will persist even longer. So what I would recommend is, hey, look, it's at least a two-year problem. So prepare for two years, right? 
Um, and then there's sectorial inflation. What's going to happen to our sectorial inflation? That probably is going to, from what we see, because a lot of it is driven by demand. So it's called demand inflation. It's people want more stuff than people are making. Mm -hmm. So by, I think, March 2020th, some of the key manufacturers of products had sold in three months more than they had planned to manufacture in the whole year. That's what happened. That's demand inflation. So, uh, and if you try to buy a car today, you'll see people are slapping premiums on the cars because there isn't any to be had. So mm -hmm. I'll charge more for it. That portion of our industry, demand inflation, it's from what we see, it's going to be here at least through the end of 2022. So whichever way you look at it, you're dealing with a 12-month to 24-month problem. It's not going to go away next month. It's going to take one or two price adjustments for people to actually get to that. And I don't know that it returns to 2020 or 2019 levels, right? I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll shorten the curve here, but I don't think we're going to go backwards. So that's why things like this calculator and tool are so important for businesses to understand where they're going. So if this sectorial inflation does level out within the next 12 months because factories reopen, more people enter the workforce, other things you know, happen that can, can help us in our industry, that we're still going to be fighting the challenges that we have today and, and need to address it. And, and to adjusting points, I'll give an example that we, we monitor. Uh, it, before COVID hit, it cost about between $2,000 and $3,000 to have a container shipped from China to the U.S. Most of our manufacturing base being dependent on product manufacturing in China. Uh, that cost is very relevant. Also, you have six months of inventory sitting in the Pacific Ocean trying to get here. Mm -hmm. There's a cost of capital. There's a cost of transportation. That cost today is $16,000. <laughs> Not only that, you used to be able to get a container for $2,000 to the port of Long Beach in California, and you would get it on a truck that same day. Ports charge about $200 to $300 a day that you keep that container on that port. Because of the scarcity of drivers, containers are sitting in a port of Long Beach, California for about 10 days. So that's another two to $3,000. So now you went from $3,000 to bring something from China here to literally $20,000. Mm. Now, if this goes back to a lower price, it's not gonna go back to three. There will be a, a portion of that price gain that will be maintained through incremental profits for that industry. So we'll never see a $3,000 container from China here ever again. We might see five, but it's not going to be three. Um, so the bad thing about inflation is that even when the causes for inflation stop, the prices never go back to where they were. It's not linear. It's a theory of limitations, right? So you go up on one, on one way, but you never come back all the way when the causes cease. Right. And I think the sectoral pull industry one anyways is also, like we already mentioned, it, there was already a correction of market that needed to be made. So I definitely don't think it's going to go, prices are going to go down below what we're sort of setting them at now, right? Or very much lower than that. Just, we already needed to be this somewhat high anyways. Before <laughs> any of this happened. Before any of it happened. We needed right. to be there. Yeah. I mean, people were still charging a hundred dollars a month, you know, t a year ago. So that's insane to me that there's still businesses out there that are that low. So it's a, it's a correction of our industry anyways, which is, I think the really good part about COVID and this inflation is that now people are actually seeing the value in what, in what they do themselves. And the, hopefully the homeowners are seeing the value in what we do at a higher rate moving forward. So that's interesting. You mentioned that I saw recently some research from the private equity sector that looked at the home services and they, what they were looking into is, okay, if all home services prices go up, what are customers going to cut first? Right. And the interesting thing, they specifically mentioned the pool industry, the pool services are among the least likely to be canceled. Mm-hmm. About 70%. It's complex. It's right? complex. But seventy percent of the, the, the people interviewed said that they would maintain their pool service. So that's encouraging data. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because there is value in what we do and should recognize that. And that should give us some assurance that we need to preserve that industry right? for what it does for our customers. Yeah. And keep the quality up, yeah. right? Right, and I can oh. go buy a lawnmower, right, for 150, 200 bucks and go mow my lawn. It won't look as good, probably, but it doesn't affect. The, if, yeah. I, if I neglect my pool, yeah. it, it turns green or it's an empty hole in the ground that someone can get. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of factors in play there. And, and sometimes, because that's is a very good point, because one of the things I, uh, we were thinking is, well, it's not only the risk that my customer will go to a cheaper company. The risk is the customer will start to do, do it, it themselves. themselves. But here's, here's a math that I ran to my team, and it, it was very illuminating. Uh, a bucket of chlorine or, or tablets, or a trichlor tablets, take that for example. Mm -hmm. we've, we've seen price projections that sell that by June, that thing could be sold retail $355. Right. <laughs> so you take $355, which is what the first thing that the customer would have to do to clean their own pool yep. and divide that by, I don't know, two years, and you're still better off paying the price increase. Right. right. <laughs> just, out of, just out of the gate, one bucket. Sure. Right. So if you don't charge, obviously some people charge for, for, for the tablets on the side, but a lot of companies don't do that. It's cheaper for the customer to actually pay your price increase than try to go out and buy a bucket of chlorine to start servicing their own pool without the guarantees of quality. And, and you know, there's a lot more complexity to pool chemistry than just throwing tablets on the pool, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Now buy stabilizers and go buy everything correct. else. And, and, and mm -hmm. so, so even if you just run that math, it's still cheap. You can tell your customers, look, if you decide to do that yourself, you're going to spend more money than you're going to spend with me. Right. Yeah, it's, an, it's complex. You know, there's, it's, you're a chemist, you're a plumber, you're an electrician. You know, there's all these things at play that they, they can't do. Right. <laughs> you know, they're not going to work on the air conditioner. Yeah. Nobody's going to go that. That's what a heater is, right? A heater or a heat pump is an air conditioner, heat pump specifically. Like that's... You're not going to work on that. <laughs> You're not going to do Mowing that. a lawn is simple. Playing right. around with acid and right, right. pH levels is a lot more difficult. Yeah, super complex, but um, that's just another piece of it for sure. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, I've seen a lot in the groups and different places, you know, from smaller companies or one pullers or even large companies that, that think this is some type of price gouging. What would you say to that? Uh, I, I would say it's absolutely not. And I'll tell you why. Um, there, there are two ways to to drive pricing. One is the price that the market will take. The other one is cost up, meaning I know my cost, I need a certain amount of profit, and whatever that cost is, I put a certain amount of profit and I price that at the minimum price that's needed to achieve that result. We're in a situation, particularly when you have inflation, where you go cost up. So we're not looking like the continuing example I had given, where people say, you know, that's scarcity. Let's take this opportunity and do this. I don't know if you do this, but the shipping industry profits jumped 83%. Mm. That's potentially price gouging. Sure. What our calculator does, it's preserve the profit. So I'm not using this opportunity to, oh, I had this little profit and I'm going to make much more profit. No, I'm trying to say, hey, maintain your cash and use that cash uh, to support your business going forward. So it doesn't have an embedded price gouging thinking behind it. We're trying to preserve, not promote beyond what our market is. Particularly because if you run your numbers, whether you're one polar or a large company, and you can run the numbers for a one polar and that calculator that we were talking about, as long as you put real numbers in there, you will see what your reality is. In our concern is that people are not seeing that. And in fact, people that think that we're price gouging might be losing uh, their businesses because they're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. Or they're using other references in the market to move their pricing. And the pricing in the market today is wrong. So if you look at the price that is predominant in the market, it's not going to lead to a good uh, solution for the, the cost problem you have. Mm -hmm. So... Look at costs. That's all I have to say to people. Put whatever numbers make sense to you in that calculator, if you will, or any other calculator. You don't have to use ours. Just run your numbers and see from a cost standpoint where you need to be. And then compare that to market. What we found is that if you just look at cost and profit, it's enough to create continuity in the industry, continuous investment, quality improvement quality of service, um, 
you will end up at a price point that's already above market. And that's, that's why it's a difficult problem, because people have to re-educate the market, as we were saying at the beginning of the interview, by explaining to their customers what happened to my cost. And again, I'm, I'm dealing with 50, 60% inflation. In some cases, as I said, a, a bucket of chlorine specifically is now 180% year-on-year inflation mm-hmm. on, on a bucket of chlorine, uh, of tablets, I'm sorry. So we're not passing 50% or 180%. We're passing a portion of that. Because as I said, you can never work back on the inflation that we already suffered. You have to work on inflation. You're going to suffer, right? So we're not price gouging. We're being very, very fine-tuned in our solution because you have to. Mm -hmm. Because the moment people think you're price gouging, your whole strategy is out the window. The problem is that we have people that don't see it and they sit, it's almost a state of denial. Say, well, no, no, this problem is going to solve itself until they have to file their taxes and figure out, well, it didn't make money this year. Right. And that is too late. Whether you're a one polar or you're a large company, gas is still $5 a gallon, right? You have to put gas in your truck. The chlorine prices are still 186% increase. Those are hard facts that you need to recognize. It's not price gouging when you're doing that cost plus analysis. And, you know, it's not their responsibility to take that hit for their customers. I think that's what they feel sometimes is I don't want to... I don't want to push it on my customer because I, I want to be the good guy, right? It's not your responsibility to do that. You know? Absolutely. But I'll <laughs> tell you, if you had a conversation with your customer explaining why my family is at risk mm-hmm. because I can't afford to buy the tablets I use to service your pool, what you find, and we found that on, on social uh, uh, media, customers says, I, I'm willing to help you out with this. Right. Customers will understand. And it was what we found. You can't be rational about it. You have to be logical. You have to be able to, to be operating out of the truth of your numbers and the truth of your reality. But if you do that, customers will understand. Sometimes we, we think we don't want to upset our customers, whereas our customer, we're giving, giving them little credit. Because mm-hmm. if you told them what the situation was, they would say, you know what? I understand. Mm-hmm. As we have heard from many. Right. And I think... Another important point that you said earlier with that is where you're trying to get to where you were before, right? You're trying to get to where you're still making the profit you were making before. We're not trying to go up 30%. We're not trying to make 30% more. Correct. You're trying to stay at whatever EBITDA, whatever cash flow you had prior to inflation. This is right? just it, getting back to home plate. Right. That's all it is. Yeah. And, and that's the port, you know, as far as price gouging, right? That's what I mean. You're not really, you're getting to the point where you can survive and pro and keep your same profitability. And you'll see that uh, at the bottom of the calculator, yeah. there are three questions. And one of them, what do I need to do to get back to my original profit? Right. Yeah. It's and important. It's important. Um, uh, and when people will already be scared by what that number is, I can guarantee you. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, and, and they say, wow, do I have to do that just to get back to where I was? Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and if you want to get ahead, you're going to have to deal with a much more difficult problem. Yeah. But, but again, um, we're not trying to convince people what the right number is. We're just trying to convince people to, hey, take a look at this. And what is the minimum amount that makes sense for you? to be able to continue to do quality work. Now, if you're trading quality for, for price, forget it. This, this, this is not the calculator for you. Right. Uh, but it's not price gouging. It's, it's, it's sur- survival of the industry mm-hmm. in, the, in allowing the industry to continue to be able to invest and to improve in quality and grow as an industry. Right. right. Um, I wanted to make another point too, because we haven't brought it up yet, but they're seeing this everywhere, right? I mean, Starbucks has gone up three times. You know, a latte is what, eight, nine dollars now almost. If, you know, for you've seen it, McDonald's or Burger King is going from 10 nuggets to eight. That's how they're adjusting, right? They're not saving you 10 nuggets anymore. They're giving you eight nuggets for the same price or whatever if they're not going to increase their price. Charmin reduced Charmin. the ply count yeah, in the toilet see, paper, right? Everybody's, everybody's correcting within all these different industries. So your homeowners are already used to seeing this and everything that they're doing. All, you know, Chipotle has gone up like whatever, you know, I think it's 18%. So, you know, everything's changing for these people. They're, they're used to it. They're not, like you said, being afraid of the number. You're not, you shouldn't be so afraid, I think, because they, they know <laughs> everybody. We, we, we all are buying it, right? We all know what it stuff costs. It's, it's insane. Yeah. We've seen other home services that have less in sectoral inflation than we have in pool raise prices probably more than what we have. 
Yeah. And so it's out there. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a window here where customers are more understanding of what's going on. Right. You'd also want to make sure that you make your moves within the window where that communication with the customer is uh, fertile, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to go tell them the story. Oh, well, I had a problem a year ago and now I can't do my service. So the story I was telling you, I can buy inventory now and for six months continue to sell my services what I am. Try telling that story to the customer 12 months down the line that you're going to raise their prices 30% now. He says, well, what happened? Nothing happened now. Inflation is actually going down. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, but I have six, to make months, up two years six ago. months ago, I had a problem. Well, sorry, I should have done that six months ago. So there's this window of opportunity here. It's not only opportunity to raise prices, but opportunity to communicate well with your customer, why this is relevant now. Mm -hmm. If you want to see Johnny in your backyard, clean your pool with the quality that Johnny always brought you. And you want Johnny to continue to have a job and his family to be able to continue to live off of what Johnny makes. We have to raise prices for Johnny's work for you. Right. Yep. Makes sense. So how do we stay ahead of inflation? Uh, you have to be nimble. If you were looking at your numbers once a month, you may want to refresh your numbers every week, if not every day. So one, one of the examples we have, we have, obviously we do repair work, for example. We exchange pumps, fix pumps, exchange heaters. Um, we have a policy now that we look at the actual cost of those products every day. And that's very important because you, from day to day, uh, we're seeing variations in there. Mm -hmm. So agility is critical. Yeah. Ability to understand where you are day in, day out is critical. That's how you get ahead of inflation. You know where things are. Uh, you know what your cash is in the bank that day. Uh, you know what your cost base is. Um, and you know the size of your customer base. And you know your price. So that's, that's the very first thing you do. If you were doing something once every month, do it once every week now. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to change prices every week, much to the contrary, but you need to know where you are. You need to protect cash. If you have cash in an inflationary environment, the opportunities for you to invest well in managing your working capital, which I buy ahead, I buy behind, I manage my, my sourcing. If you have cash, you're in a better position to do that than if you don't have cash. The one thing you don't want to do in an inflationary economy is go to the bank and ask money to finance working capital. Different story to invest for investments, but for working capital, you should not have to go to the bank. And if you, the first sign you see of a company uh, going under is the increase in interest cost. You can look at that in the PL, see interest rate uh, costs going up, that company is going to be out of business. So protect your cash because of that. So that, that would be the second thing. First, be very agile, look at things very frequently. Second, protect cash. It's a real important asset. Um, and you mentioned knowing your trade-offs and your break-even points. Yeah, I think the third is to make educated, well-thought-out decisions rather than impulsive, rash decisions that are more reactionary. Take the knowledge that you've gained and use that to your advantage. Yeah, and th that knowledge is important because the other uh, thing is trade-offs, as you were mentioning, right? If you know where you are and, and you have the cash and you decide how you're going to use that, you need now to explain to your base why you're doing the things you're doing. And that knowledge is critical for you to do it well, right? And then you have to look at your base and decide what my trade-offs are. Who do I want to keep? Who, do, who do I want to serve? It's not just a matter of, oh, I'm going to keep this. Who do I want to serve? Who are the people that see the value in what I do? And that sets your trade-offs. So you can adjust uh, to a, a, a base that sees value in what you do at the price you do it for. Mm -hmm. That stabilizes your, your inflationary environment, right? And the hope is that as you do that, what you're trying to do, to do fundamentally to fight inflation is to slow things down. 
And yet I'm here telling you, hey, you've got to look at things more frequently. It's the measure twice, cut once approach. You really look at your reality. You make one move and hold it. It has to be such a bold move that it has to be able to hold for a long period of time. But the moment you signal, things are going to be like this for 12 months. You start to slow things down. And that's very effective in fighting off inflation. Inflation is a fundamentally an acceleration of things. You have to decelerate price movements if you want inflation to come down. And the only way you do this is jumping ahead. If you're always catching up, you're always going to be behind. This is like a high-speed chase in a highway. The only way to stop the guy you're, you're chasing is to get in front of him. If you keep behind, you go faster, he'll go faster. Mm-hmm. And the only way to really stop, if you see this, is you get ahead. So you jump ahead of the inflation and you lock it down. Make sure you can operate within those uh, parameters for a long period of time. And then you start to slow things down and things start to fall into place. The container situation that I refer to, right now ports have 60% less containers parked in their, their uh, uh, yards than they had before because they start solving the demand problem. Mm-hmm. That's going to start to slow things down. Right. And that mechanism is ultimately what's going to drive prices back to where they should be and they will still be higher we need to create that same thing in our environment we need to jump ahead lock it down slow things down allow people to see hey there is stability around these decisions that were made and hopefully we'll we'll experience lower sectoral inflation very good that was a great interview guys really appreciate your time i think everybody's going to learn a lot from here again we'll put the calculator On the website, we'll work with you guys to do that so you can access that. All links will be in the show notes. But if people want to get a hold of you, how would they contact MPP for more information? Our our emails are on our website, and they can go to go-npp.com and look up Augusto, myself, all of our team is, is listed. Awesome. Thanks again for being on the show with us today. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. Hey, Pool Chasers. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. To connect with today's guests, including pictures, links, and resources from everything discussed today, you can visit the episode page at poolchasers.com or click the links below. To connect more with us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter by searching at Pool Chasers. If you would like to support the podcast, the easiest and most effective way is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as share the show or your favorite episode with a friend or on social media. Also, you can get early access to each episode by supporting us through Patreon. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for sharing some of yours with us today. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.